Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to see so many people coming back again. And hello to those people who are new to us. I was very pleased to note in the in the joining that someone mentioned they were in Langport in Somerset. So hello to you, because the film we show at the beginning about Loham, that's very close to you, I believe. So um, good to see you there and, and from wherever you've come from. So um, I'm here just to tell you a little bit about the work of the Trust. Um, so I'm Peter Rez, I'm Chief Executive, and uh, we've been around for about 50 years as a charity. We were set up as a genuine partnership between church and state to look after historic churches, which were of huge significant heritage value that no longer had a worshipping congregation to look after them. And now we've collected 356 of them across England, and we take on about two or three more every year. Obviously, we're quite concerned about the impact of COVID, not only for the impact that it's had globally on everybody uh, and the economies and, and, and everyone who's suffered, but for direct, more directly for our work, um, we're wondering whether actually there may be more closures of historic churches as communities feel they're not able to uh, keep them open. And, and we're very much standing by because we feel that our strategy is, is very much aimed at how do we support communities to use and love their historic places of worship. These are amazing buildings. They have the most profound link with the place that they are and they tell the story of absolutely everybody from the richest to the poorest and it's a, a fabulous cultural inheritance that we have and we don't want to see them become irrelevant. They're a, such an important part of our landscape not only physically but also um, socially as well. So <clears throat> we've lost uh, income of around half a million pounds this year because our strategy is aimed at having events in lots of our churches across the country and Christmas is particularly tricky for us because we would normally host a whole range of carol services across uh, across the country uh, and it's very sad not to be doing the rounds this year and, and having those very special moments of candle lit carol services in small communities all over the place. So we hope that the carol service that we're providing on Saturday is some way to bring people together from all across the world. I've seen a quick rush of, of some of the, the footage. There's a beautiful moment when uh, where, where choirs from across the world join in in one carol and I must say it brought a tear to my eye. It was a very very beautiful thing. The quality of the music is fantastic uh, and we're very pleased that the Prince of Wales has decided to uh, introduce it for us as well. So please do come along six o'clock on Saturday. Um, it would be great to see you there but in the meantime uh, please do join us, uh, sign up for our newsletter, become a member, donate, everything you do there will be very helpful and of course by Nick's book because it is fantastic and I would be here holding a copy of you if it weren't for the Christmas post and my copy hasn't turned up yet uh, which I'm very disappointed about but it's something for me to look forward to. So without further ado really let me introduce the uh, the star of the show today which is Nick Page. We're really pleased to have him with us um, and so he's been busy writing his book this year and I think he was suggesting that lockdown may have helped with that process earlier on today. He's prized for his skills as a writer, speaker, unlicensed historian, applied ranter and general information monger, a former BBC comedy writer. He's written uh, somewhere between 70 and 80 books, but he can explain why I've said that, including most recently his nearly infallible series, which also looks fantastic. So without further ado, let me hand you over to fantastic Nick Page. Thank you very much for doing for this, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for that intro. Uh, I yes, unlicensed historian. I have to say, I have a syndrome. I just don't own up to it now. Um, everybody's got a syndrome nowadays, but but I have a syndrome, and it's called imposter syndrome, and I suffer from it quite a lot. Um, and in particularly uh, in conditions like this, when I look at previous lecturers and all this kind of thing. In fact, the very word lecture sends me into a cold sweat. So um, I'm not a trained academic historian, but I suppose I am a historian in the sense of the original sense of the word, somebody which means inquiry, uh, somebody who is curious about things. Curiosity for me is a driving force. And so that's really led me into many different paths. Um, I have written a lot of books, as Peter said, uh, many of them for children, and they come out in all kinds of editions. Hence, I can never be quite sure how many I've written. But anyway, um, we're gonna talk about the, the, the latest one. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a writer, historian, speaker. Um, I'm driven by curiosity. I'm also driven a bit by outrage. As I get older, uh, I often say to, to blokes, I say, well, you're going to get grumpy as you get older. You might as well get grumpy about something that matters. And so part of my work is for an organisation called Open Doors, which supports the persecuted church around the world. Uh, theologically speaking, of course, the church, 
is the people, not the buildings. The church is what you have left uh, when the building burns down. Sadly, uh, all around the world, there are many churches, church buildings being attacked and uh, individuals. And so I'm kind of interested in the conservation of the church all around, really, buildings and people. And really not so just just for preservation's sake either. And I think this is one of the things about the church's conservation trust, as I understand it. And this is why it's so important. It's not just about preserving monuments, but about preserving the meaning of the monuments and their significant for, significance for the communities. Um, in the intro to one of your recent lectures, but lectures Peter uh, talked about how churches have a profound relationship with landscape and the community. And, um, and I think that is true. And I, th I think they have a, a, a relationship with a border landscape as well. Churches have a, a, a relationship with, if you like, the social, artistic and cultural landscape of this country like no other buildings. And uh, that is inextricably and profoundly bound up with the church. Churches, I believe, stand um, not just as, as significant buildings, but as a testimony to a past history. And I, I think the problem is a lot of that past history is in danger of being forgotten or dismissed as irrelevant or being rewritten entirely. And, and, and few things, the funny thing is few things illustrate that more than Christmas, uh, a festival which comes from the church. You know, that, that is its basis. It comes from the church. And yet I feel that as our society gets more secular and, you know, uh, indeed a little bit more aggressively secular, there's almost a sense of shame about anything with Christian roots. Um, and what I've noticed about Christmas and really why I wrote the book is there's there's a sort of drip drip continual attempt to uh, paganize it, if you like, to say, well, no, actually, it's really, really comes from pagan roots. And I really wanted to investigate that. People want to detach Christmas from the church. And I wanted to investigate that because each year you get an, a sleigh load, another sleigh load of festive fake news arriving. Um, you know, and it could be various things. Uh, you know, Christmas ori was originally a, a Roman festival of the sun or Christmas trees are pagan or mistletoes are something to do with Druids or, or you know, Coca-Cola invented Santa, all kinds of stuff. Or, or yeah, all kinds of uh, stuff like that. And the thing is, it's all utter baubles. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk for too long, I hope. I'm going to leave time for me to bluff through a load of questions. Um, what I'm going to try and do now is share my screen if I can and uh, we'll get the presentation up. There we go. Hopefully that's working. Yeah. There we go. So, so that's so you don't have to look at me the whole time. Um, yes, here's the book. Christmas, Tradition, Truth and Total Baubles. Now, I'm not going to go through all the stuff uh, in the book for um, obvious reasons. <laughs> I want you to buy it, basically. Um, but I'm going to pick up on a few themes relating specifically to churches. And I want really to uh, pick up on a couple of main themes that I investigate in the book, main ways in which I think history gets misinterpreted or gets uh, rewritten in a way. Um, and here's the first one that I want to talk about. If it looks pagan, it must be pagan. People get fooled, you see. And, uh, and they think that things look a bit like, well, they don't look very churchy. They don't look very obviously churchy. And so, so must, must have originated outside church, must be older. Few things illustrate this more than the Yule log. The Yule log, uh, a BBC web page on the Yule log. Oh, yeah, I'll show you a picture of one, there it is. Um, a BBC web page wrote this about the Yule log. The pagan celebration of winter solstice, also known as Yule, is one of the oldest winter celebrations in the world. It begins um, and, and then it, get, before, and it goes on to state confidently that the Norsemen lit bonfires, told stories and drank sweet ale and that it was the Druids who began the tradition of the Yule log. That's all on a BBC web page, uh, so it must be true. It's on the BBC. Um, and, and, here we see a picture of the Yule log. These people are obviously um, Tudor or Elizabethan or, or Jacobean, I guess, and they're dragging in the Yule log. I, th I hope they're not going to put that little child on the fire, but you never know Christmas being what it is. And uh, the idea of the Yule log is, you know, it's, it, you put this enormous log on the fire and it burns all through the 12 days of Christmas. I've always had a problem with this. Uh, firstly, you know, I mean, 12 days burning, really? 
you can get rid of a body and burning in three days, I think. Um, or so I'm told. I mean, you know, I can't verify that. Um, but more than that, it, this is this is just utter baubles, I'm afraid. Um, you I mean, just to pick up on a few things on that that web page, Yule wasn't celebrated at the winter solstice. Um, insofar as it was celebrated at all, it was a very minor uh, Viking feast called Yule. Um, Yule is actually the name for months, the months of the year, two months of the year around winter. It's not a name of a feast at all, but there was a sort of time of drinking, but that was mid-December, if anything. It doesn't predate Christmas. The earliest accounts of it come from 1200 AD. Uh, it may have come from about 1000 AD. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the Druids and most things don't. Um, and the first, more significantly, the first ever mention of the Yule log comes from 1725. 1725, so this picture, is a load of baubles. They did not drag a yule. And now I'm not saying that ancient people didn't burn logs at Christmas. It's it's flipping cold at Christmas. Of course you're going to burn something. But it's all to do with this idea. It looks a bit pagan, you see, doesn't it? It looks a bit pagan, and so people will assume that it's part of the pagan world and that we've picked up on it. There's a um, you know, there's another uh, pagan. Um, tradition, so-called pagan tradition, which is mentioned. Uh, in the book, I, uh, I made a lot of uh, use of this particular reference work, the Ladybird book of the stories of our Christmas customs, because I figure, you know, you ought to go to, to the proper reference. Well, I have to say, sadly, it proved to be less than historically reliable. I was disappointed, but there you go. Um, and uh, they talk about mistletoe in there. So mistletoe, another tradition that is often said to be pagan, let me let me read you what the Ladybird Book of Christmas Customs says about mistletoe. Um, there is a very old northern legend, it says, which explains why we hang up mistletoe at Christmas. Balder, the sun god, uh, I don't know if he had any brothers called Bald and Baldest, but anyway, Balder, the sun god, was so fine and great that the other gods promised never to hurt him. They placed a spell on everything to take care of him. Water would not drown him, nor could arrows, swords, and poisons kill him. When the gods were laying their spells, they forgot the mistletoe. <laughs> now Loki, the god of evil, found this out and made a sharp arrow out of a mistletoe branch. He put the arrow in the hands of the blind god Herder and guided Herder's hand so that the arrow struck Balder. Balder was killed, but the other gods brought him back to life again, and the mistletoe promised never to hurt anyone again. So speaking mistletoe. The story, this story made the mistletoe an emblem of love. And then the Ladybird book does a quick swerve and it says, Jesus taught that we should love others as ourselves. So Christians kept the mistletoe as an emblem of love. To remember this teaching, they kissed under it. And so we have the tradition of kissing under the mistletoe. Now, sadly, as I said, that's not strictly historically accurate. Firstly, the actual story about Balder being kissed, killed by mistletoe occurs in various um, variations some of which in some of which he, in which he remains thoroughly killed and doesn't come back in others it's not the mistletoe that kills him it's a sword called uh, mistletoe um, but it obviously you know mistletoe has become this uh, key thing and certainly the habit of kissing under the mistletoe is nothing to do with that let me just uh, um, show you a few pictures of mistletoe we can see uh, a Victorian um, uh, picture of a boy returning with a Christmas tree and a mistletoe and, and a, a scythe that looks, well, somewhat too sharp for a, a child of that age. And then obviously the Druids get associated with mistletoe and here is a completely inaccurate picture of a Druid priest, priestess bearing mistletoe. And then we have the habit of kissing under the mistletoe. So it feels very ancient mistletoe, Baldo and Norse and all this kind of stuff. But literally the only thing that our habit of hanging mistletoe has in common with the Norse legend of Balder is the word mistletoe. There's absolutely nothing else in common. The earliest mention of mistletoe uh, being brought into houses comes from the mid 1600s in a poem by Robert Herrick. Um, it's, it's not referred to before then. Now, I'm not saying people didn't do it before then, but it's, there's no reference to it before the mid 1600s. And the first mention of kissing under it has absolutely nothing to do with, um, you know, Christianity, as the Ladybird book said, or Balder, or anything like that. Um, certainly nothing to do with fertility myths. It's, it comes from a comic opera uh, called Two for One, written in 1784, which uh, refers to people kissing under the mistletoe. There's nothing Christian about kissing under mistletoe. 
equally, there's, there's nothing specifically pagan about it. People are not performing an ancient fertility rite, apart from the very ancient fertility rite of wanting to snog someone you fancy and having to find an excuse for it. Um, but somehow, you know, mistletoe seems a bit pagan. And uh, I think uh, for Christians and for, for many people, this association of paganism with, with greenery has meant that they've looked on Christian traditions around that with quite some suspicion. Uh, and, and, uh, but in fact, there's an, the ancient uh, connection of churches with greenery at this time of year is very, very strong. Um, according to the Tudor historian, John Stowe, he says this, at Christmas, at every man's house and also his parish church was decked with holm, which is holly, ivy, bay, and whatsoever the season of the year afforded to be green. Um, it's, churches have always decorated with greenery, and it's actually a tradition that goes right back to, if, uh, to the Syria in the, in the fourth century, we can trace it back, where Christians decorated their homes. Now, did Romans do it? Probably. I mean, it's human, isn't it? What you what are you going to decorate your houses with in this time of year, or well, any time of year, really? You don't have uh, they didn't have wallpaper in Roman times, so they brought in you know all kinds of, uh, of decoration. Um, indeed, in fact, churches have have, as I said, a very very long association with it. Um, of of all the church records that survive from the Middle Ages, uh, late Middle Ages in England, almost all record purchases of holly and ivy uh, at this time of year, and this continued. Uh, for centuries. In the medieval times, every church was decorated. There's a, there's a, um, a, a bit of dog law that dates from quite early on. It says, holly and ivy, box and bay, put in the church on Christmas day. In fact, uh, decorating your church with greenery became almost a kind of liturgical thing. There were certain plants you were supposed to put in at certain times of the year. Um, again, Robert Herrick in his, his uh, poems mentions this in Ceremonies for Candlemas Eve. He, he, said, he, taught, he says the Christmas plants of rosemary, bay and holly, and then the Candlemas, which is in February, you um, raise up box and, um, and you keep the box in the church the, until Easter day, and then you replace it with you. And so um, different plants have different symbolism. Um, it, it's such an ancient association with churches. It's, it's not pagan. It's not, it's not really Christian, it's human. We like plants and there's nothing wrong with that. But increasingly you see it as implied that somehow anything to do with plants, anything to do with trees, anything to do with nature cannot possibly sort of be Christian, it's got to be outside. And so you get this, the holly and the ivy. Holly and the ivy, uh, that well-known Christmas carol, um, it's not, as I've seen it described, some kind of ancient pagan fertility symbol anything like that. Holly and the ivy emerges from churches because it's what people saw in churches. And although the idea of holly and ivy there as a metaphor in poems goes back um, to sort of uh, about the 16th century, 15th century, you find them mentioned. This hymn is not old either. Um, in fact, the song dates from 1810. It's not a pagan song, it's to do with church decorations. Um, so that illustrates well the other theme of the book. We talked about if it's pagan, if it looks pagan, it must be pagan. Uh, oh, I just threw that in because it made me laugh. I don't know why I put that in, but you know, health and safety. Um, it's what every child is wearing nowadays. Um, anyway, um, the next theme of the book if it looks old, it must be old. Um, again, this is so common. Uh, and as people who are interested in ancient churches, you'll understand that sometimes what appears to be very old isn't actually very old at all. Um, it's it just been made to look that way. Uh, again, a good illustration of this, Christmas is Christmas carols. The Christmas carol concert tradition, um, you know, looking forward to the Christmas uh, carols that, we, that uh, CCT are putting on, but you know, the nine lessons in carols and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, carols were originally, um, party songs. They date back, uh, well the word is used back in sort of medieval times. They're songs with dances really. They're the equivalent of sort of medieval disco really. Dances and drinking um, are largely carols and because they've got associated with feasts, um, i.e. dancing and drinking, they're naturally sung at festivals and um, really Christmas becomes the major festival 
Uh, by the 16th century, the song, the word really means um, any song with a sort of seasonal festival connection, not just Christmas. But eventually sort of the gravitational pull of Christmas uh, drags carols in close to the season. In 1521, the um, pioneering printer, publisher, Winkin' De Word, that's a great name, isn't it? Uh, publishers had proper names in those days. Uh, he published a collection of Christmas carols um, although that included some secular lyrics as well. But they weren't really sung in churches. Well, hymns weren't really either, that's a different issue. But, but carols were not sung in churches, they were sung in homes or outside um, uh, the home by carol singers moving around the village and generally irritating people. Here's, a, here's an engraving of a group of carolers arriving at a house and uh, you can tell that's um, fake because somebody is playing the bagpipes and the two people are actually pleased to see him instead of actually setting the wolfhound on him, which any sensible person would uh, clearly do. They weren't sung in churches, even though they gained uh, much more of a sacred um, kind of character very early on. Uh, they become, uh, uh, they, they are full of Christmas themes, um, the virgin, the child, the, the, the birth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they're sung outside the church. It's not really until the 19th century that carols move inside uh, the church. Um, the Church of England sort of frowned on that kind of singing, and, and they frowned on it partly because the, also uh, a bit earlier than that, the, in the non-conformist churches, uh, people started singing songs, so the Anglican church wasn't really very keen on that. And so when antiquarians um, uh, started publishing collections of carols, uh, they came as something of a surprise to uh, many sort of high, high churchgoers that these things uh, almost existed. Um, the first collections of carols were published in the early 1800s, the first one uh, really being um, uh, this one by Davis Gilbert, some ancient Christmas carols uh, from the west of England. And you can see there's only eight carols in that, in that collection. This was uh, published in 1822. Um, I think that 1832. Anyway, um, and so the collections start to get published a bit more. Uh, and then um, you get people calling for them to be bought inside the church. So the historian Sabine uh, Baring Gould, who uh, uh, gave this sort of uh, preface to a collection of camels from a bit, a bit later on, he, he said, We want some hearty festival singing of carols at each of the great feasts. By all means, let us take the opportunity and give them a performance of carols at the festivals. We cannot go far wrong in utilizing the carol in our churches. Why is it to be sung outside? By all means, bring people in and let them hear it and join it with heart and voice. He was quite irritated, in fact, that uh, carols were being sung by the pesky nonconformists and he wanted them bought inside. And so um, they begin to come inside the church and it's not really until the mid um, 19th century that that begins to happen. Um, and then uh, with the sort of revival of interest in Christmas that, that's really triggered by Dickens in this country and a Christmas carol, um, new carols started to come off the production line. Uh, in America, which by the mid 19th century had become the sort of spiritual home of Christmas with everything that goes with it, um, they really started banging out the camels, I tell you. And so they wrote things like We Three Kings from Orient Are, uh, Away in a Manger, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, A Little Town of Bethlehem, even Jingle Bells, uh, which doesn't sound particularly uh, Christmas carol uh, kind of oriented, was written uh, by a church organist in 1857. And in the end, the Anglican church gave in, and it did so in a typically Anglican way by inventing a brand new ancient tradition. Um, which is this, Nine Lessons and Carols. Nine Lessons and Carols. Now, there's nothing that says Christmas more to me than Nine Lessons and Carols. I don't know about you, uh, but my Christmas sort of begins at three o'clock, Christmas Eve, sit down with a vat of sherry and a barrel load of mince pies and, and listen to Nine Lessons and Carols. Um, it's quite interesting because it seems so traditional, seems so ancient, but it, it was first done in 1880 in Truro. Uh, Bishop E.W. Benson, who later became Archbishop of Canterbury, started it up. Uh, and he, he didn't do it, as this, um, this little illustration shows, this, the, the caption to that uh, 
um, I guess it was the first copy of um, the service, says Bishop Benson felt that a carol service would succeed in tempting people away from public houses. There's no evidence he thought that at all. True, uh, cathedral was being built at the time, and so they actually met in a big sort of shed. I think he just wanted to get people into the shed, and he thought it was a good idea. 1880, nine lessons and carols. It's not until 1918 that the first service of nine lessons and carols was done from King's College in Cambridge. And then 1928, the first radio broadcast. And, 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 but the interesting thing is by 1939, the BBC publicity department is writing uh, that the festival has been held since the chapel was built nearly 500 years ago. Which sounds better than the, fest the, the festival has been held all oh, for about 20 years. Um, you know, it, it's become this ancient tradition. So just because it looks old doesn't mean that it is old. And of course, the key thing is all traditions have to be invented. I think that's the main theme of the book. All our Christmas traditions get invented. Once they're invented, their actual origins get forgotten. And they're always assumed to be either, uh, you know, more old, older than they are, in fact. This goes back even to the original Christmas itself. I'll just say a few words on this and then we'll pause for questions. But the original Christmas itself is, of course, a completely invented festival. The early church did not celebrate Christmas. Uh, you know, back in the, the days of the Apostolic Church and the Church Fathers, they didn't celebrate uh, Christmas at all. And they didn't do it for two reasons. The first and very obvious reason is they didn't know the date. Nobody knew when Jesus was born. The Gospels, and only two of the Gospels record the Nativity story, the Gospels don't give any actual date. All they, just, all they say was that some shepherds were in the field. That's the only way we can um, work out the time. And that means probably somewhere between March and November, actually, uh, that's normal time of pastoring, but they didn't know the date. But more importantly, they didn't actually like birthdays. Birthdays were seen, in fact, as pagan things. And so uh, the, the first century, uh, the, uh, not the first century, uh, but the fourth century uh, scholar, third century scholar, Oregon, wrote this. He said, only sinners rejoice over this kind of birthday. The worthless man who loves things connected with birth keeps birthday festivals. Um, Origin is, uh, yeah, sorry, he's 185 to 254, something like that. Anyway, they didn't like it. Birthdays were seen as, as a bit, you know, down. Um, so nobody took any notice of it really. So why did Christians invent uh, Christmas? Well, a number of reasons. The first being that Christianity got surprisingly popular. Uh, once uh, Constantine comes in, in the early fourth century, you know, uh, Christians, uh, Christianity becomes an official religion and they can build churches and then you've got to fill the churches with something. And so extra festivals grow up. A around this time, the most notable one is a festival called Epiphany which is celebrated on the 6th of January. And that's very, uh, that's a, a festival that grows up in the east of the empire, um, around Constantinople and that area over there. Um, and that, that's celebrated on the 6th of January. It's really a baptism festival. It celebrates the baptism of Jesus, but it becomes associated very much with uh, Jesus' birth, Jesus' nativity. Um, and it was celebrated particularly in Bethlehem, this is a picture of the church at Bethlehem, probably I think the oldest continually used church in the world, um, going back to the early 300s. And um, it's obviously the, over the grotto of the cave where Jesus um, is uh, uh, supposed to have been born. Epiphany becomes a very big celebration in Bethlehem, starts the day before, uh, with uh, a reading of Luke in, in the fields around uh, Bethlehem, uh, in the shepherd's fields, as they're known. And then there was an all-night vigil, followed by a service the next day, which read what the other uh, nativity um, uh, account in the Gospels. And by 400, we know that there was a big procession, there was, an, there was a midnight mass, and then there was a big procession back the next day to Jerusalem, where there'd be another mass in the morning. And so, by the time of John Cassian, who's a monk writing um, in the early 5th century, in the early 400s, he wrote that in Egypt, the clergy regarded Epiphany as the time both of our Lord's baptism and also of his birth in the flesh. It becomes Jesus' birthday. However, in the West, they didn't, they didn't epiph. They didn't do Epiphany. Uh, they had their own celebration. 
And their tradition placed the birth of Jesus on the 25th of December. It's a tradi tradition that begins, um, it, we can date to the fourth century, to around 350. Why on the 25th of December? Why didn't they follow the Epiphany tradition? Well, partly because there was a bit of rivalry between the Western side of the empire and the Eastern side in terms of Christianity. And so I think they wanted their own festival. Partly because there seems to have been a tradition around the significance of the number 25. No one's really very sure. And I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this. No one's very sure, but they, the, there was a, there seems to be a North African tradition and in the Latin speaking churches that uh, the world was created. Uh, creation took place on the 25th of March. I don't know how they got there, but they got there. So that with a nice kind of sense of symmetry, they also assumed that the, the arrival of Jesus, the conception Jesus was on the 25th of March as well because it's like the creation of a new creation and so maybe nine months forward from that well it does give you 25th of December and that's possibly where it came from no one's entirely sure what's normally claimed is that the church in Rome nicked another festival they nicked the Roman festival of the uh, unconquered sun which is on the 25th of November, uh, 25th of December. Now, again, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go into all the details about this, but when I investigated this, when I looked at it, here's, here's the facts, okay? The earliest, the first actual recorded uh, mention of uh, Christmas, Jesus's birth being on the 25th of December comes from a document called the Philokalian calendar, which dates from 354 AD. The first mention of a festival of the unconquered sun well, it doesn't say sun, actually, but the festival of the unconquered deity, assumed to be the sun, being on the 25th of December, comes from the Philokalian calendar written in 354 AD. In fact, the first mentions of both festivals are in the same document. So you cannot say that one preceded the other. Or actually, you can, well, you can say Christmas may have, because the, the mention of Christmas comes in a bit of the Philokalian calendar, that is dated earlier, that really comes from about 20 years earlier. There's no, there's, the point is there's absolutely no evidence of a Roman festival on the 25th of December predating uh, Christmas at all. Um, there's no evidence really of a solstice festival in Rome on that day either. The, early, the, the church historian Andrew McGowan says this, he says, uh, the solstice did fall on 25th of December, but the idea of a major sun feast on that day before the Christian incarnation feast, Christmas, was established is probably a fantasy. So we don't know really why they chose the 25th of December. Um, it wasn't a Roman festival. I don't think there's any real evidence of that. Uh, and uh, it, they had their own reasons for doing it. And so uh, anyway, they invent Christmas and after that it, it grows and it grows. Uh, Christmas was originally a simple festival. It was a one day thing, which is why the days around it have nothing to do with Christmas. So the day after Christmas, what we call Boxing Day is the festival of St. Stephen, nothing to do with Christmas. Um, and, and there's various other bits and pieces around that. And then it grows, I should, I should motor on. And um, in Rome, they set up their own version of the uh, uh, churches elsewhere. So um, they build the church of St. Mary Major, which has a little, um, a reliquary of the original crib. There it is in the box. There's Jesus looking rather loose, lying on the box at the top there. And there's a reliquary of the, the original manger. And they had their own like epiphany procession around that. So they, they have a midnight mass at this place and then they process to another church the next day. And they sort of do things like they, they did it out in the home country out in Jerusalem. Advent gets added. Uh, we don't know quite when. Probably it starts in the East as a preparation for Epiphany because Epiphany was uh, baptism. But the interesting thing about Advent is it's a fast. It's not a time when you open lots of little windows and get chocolate or anything like that. It's a fast because you're preparing for uh, the feast. And that gets standardized in the West by Pope um, Gregory the Great uh, in around the early 600s, um, fixed it at four weeks. It's still six weeks in, in the East, um, but it's four weeks in the West. Uh, and then the whole thing begins to snowball and Christians invent loads and loads more and we get all this stuff uh, coming up, three kings and stables and innkeepers, none of which are in the original uh, account. And Christmas, I suppose, just gets enculturated. It gets, it gets represented in our world and that's perfectly okay as long as you don't lose sight of the origins, as long as you don't think that is 
the sort of real thing. I love this uh, this slide, this picture from Bruegel, which is the nativity set in in uh, you know the medieval Netherlands, and there, well, the whole village is turning out. A lot of them are carrying on as normal, but the whole village is turning out to come and see the nativity, which is happening just down in one little corner. Um, in the end, Christmas, the whole thing gets smothered like uh, the, our Christmas trees in in baubles. So that's just a little bit about the origin of Christmas. I suppose the question is, why then has it survived? Why has it turned into the huge celebration that it is? There were lots of reasons for that, not least um, commercialization, industrialization in the 19th century. Um, but I think actually it comes back down to that choice that the early church made and where to put Christmas. They chose to put it in midwinter. And I think that was a very wise choice. They saw obviously as some kind of symbolism in there. But I think Christmas is, is ultimately uh, around all those kinds of themes. It's, it's about light in the darkness. It's about hope in times of hardship. It's about warmth and family and friendship and feasting. And we need all that at this time of year. It's about new birth, about the radical possibility that peace on earth might actually be possible. And, uh, it, you know, I think this year of all years, it feels like we need a bit of that. But I think that is primarily why Christmas has survived, why it's still so huge, and why that invented feast still dominates our cultural landscape. Thank you very much for listening, and I will now bluff my way through any questions that you have. Let me see if I can turn off sharing, George. Thank you ever so much, Nick. That's been really um, great to hear from you there. And um, thank you for your humour for, humor throughout then. Um, there's been some really great comments um, coming throughout the lecture as well as some questions. So everyone, we're now going into question time. Now, um, I should say there is a minor glitch at the moment on Facebook, um, whereby comments aren't um, continuously loading on the comment feed. So you may have to refresh um, your feed, but we're um, constantly re refreshing the feed at our end. So we're getting your questions coming in. So if you have any questions, now's the time to start commenting away. Um, but if you've already commented your question, we will have picked it up. Um, as I said, everyone, um, if you've enjoyed Nick's talk and want to know more, um, please do go and buy his book. Um, it's really great. Um, I've really enjoyed reading it. Um, there's some really fantastic chapters in there. My favourite so far is all about, um, as you can imagine, is about church traditions or church baubles. And um, the story about the nativity crib really is great. So um, do everyone um, buy that through our website. Um, we'll post a link to um, the page where you can get it directly on our website now. And it's £8 plus postage and packaging. Um, so everyone, um, let's dive straight into some questions. Um, so the first one we've had come in, Nick, Mm. I'm just going to jump here. I've got a summary here. Um, in the far distant future, will there be myths or um, legends created for ladies who decorate churches with flowers, do you think? <laughs> yeah, you see, now that's the interesting thing is I, uh, you know, flower arrangers in churches sometimes get a bad, uh, a, a bad rap, but they are engaging in what turns out to be a very ancient church tradition. And also, yeah, I mean, good luck to you if you go up and tell the church, uh, the ladies who are flower arranging that they're pagans. They can do some horrible things to you with florist wire. So I would re really wouldn't do that. Thanks, Nick. And uh, we, obviously we've talked about, and, and when you've used your citations, there's no written evidence for some of the things you've been stating. Mm. What about oral tradition and oral history? Do we need to um, sometimes take account of that, that then just because it's not written, mm. and yeah, yeah, sure. it didn't exist? Sure, and that is that is the the the, the way that a lot of traditions get carried on, uh, and they they're passed down. I think what the problem is that there are gaps, and so from a historical point of view, it's that there's not a continuity, and so just because two things look alike doesn't mean they're the same thing, you know. And so that's the, that's the problem, um, you know. We know, for example. Um, let's go with the druids we don't know much about the druids virtually everything spoken about the druids that you see nowadays is complete baubles but you know they did have a thing about oak groves but that doesn't mean that if i have if i go to oak furniture land i'm engaging in a druidical practice that's not the same thing so it's just it's just because it looks the same so folklore traditions i think are important but they can only take us so far i think and and you just need stronger evidence than that to say uh, uh, to, to guarantee the continuity of a tradition and one of the things that you mentioned, Art, we were talking about mistletoe um, mm -hmm. earlier on, and we've had a question come in about that. Um, and someone's asked, um, 
Surely mistletoe, uh, kissing under the mistletoe, was originally restricted to parts of the country where mistletoe actually grows. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I guess it would be. I mean, the, again, the thing is that, like I said, the earliest reference to it, to kissing under mistletoe, comes from uh, the, the 18th century. Um, and so I guess actually before then, well, look, you know, the thing is, if, I wouldn't want to minimise the, the, the um, association of Christmas and feasting and the association of churches and feasting. And, and feasting and drinking brings with it all kinds of behavior that we, you know, churches might at other times frown on or whatever. So I'm sure that um, there were other traditions that allowed people to, uh, you know, get together at Christmas in ways that they normally wouldn't be allowed to. But um, yes, a, a mistletoe, we don't know quite how it grew up. The earliest reference is, is Herrick in the mid, mid uh, 17th century, 1650s. Um, and then the earliest kissing reference is a century later, really, more or less. Um, and um, someone's here asked here about what's um, uh, so the idea. Do you, um, we've talked about um, early paganism and sort of the church planting. Someone asked the question here: Was this part of the church um, when they sort of you know um, established the Feast of Christ, uh, Christmas? And um, was this part of the church cleansing paganism, and trying to purify old traditions by planting their own traditions? on top of things? Well, this is something I'm looking into quite a lot because my next book will be on churches and uh, you know why we do the things within them that we do. And I think the, it depends where you are, that is the answer to that. So in, the, in Europe, there's certainly a lot of evidence that churches moved into old temples and cleansed them, if you want to use that, that language, you know, repurposed them. That happened quite a lot. I don't believe there's any shred of evidence of that happening in Britain. Uh, no, no Anglo-Saxon temple has ever been found under a church and no Anglo-Saxon temple has ever been found actually, as far as I know. Um, and so I think, again, there's an assumption that church has somehow moved in and took over things, but I don't think there's evidence of that. Um, now, you know, when I talk about paganism, I think what I'm kind of talking about is a structured religion you know, with sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. I'm not really talking about folk superstition. We know there was loads of that. There's lots of that in, in the Middle Ages and beyond. Even, even quite late, you get um, accounts of, uh, there's an account I mentioned in the book of uh, women, um, some girls going to bed with holly in their beds to sort of drive out the, 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 de the devils. I mean, that sounds like you're in more danger if you go to bed with a bunch of holly that uh, can't see how that's going to protect you from anything but um you know so there's a lot of folk superstition and a lot of sort of magic kind of stuff charms but most of the charms seem to have christian iconography in them or to be sort of mixed up with saints for example one of the magic charms that was used or one of the, the sort of spells that we've got invokes the three kings uh, and it's a spell against lep uh, um, not leprosy what's the one with epilepsy that's the one, um, you know, and the idea is some kind of linkage because the, the, the Magi fell at the feet of Jesus. The idea, oh, falling will link it with epilepsy and they can protect us. I don't know how it works, but there you go. So I think there's the, the evidence of Christian sort of overwriting paganism, absorbing it might have happened in bits, but we don't really have any solid evidence of it. Thanks, Nick. And sorry, anyone, if there's some audio coming through from my end, um, which sounds like grunting. It's not me. Um, it's actually I've got a dog um, who's um, starting to fall asleep <laughs> and is snoring quite loudly. So sorry for that. Um, we've had some questions here about the dates of when Christmas ends. So uh -huh. what, um, we, are, we often hear about the 12 days of Christmas. And someone's asked a question here, which I think is quite interesting, is that what do you think about keeping the crib up until Candlemas? which um, we do in um, the Christmas season, uh, some people think is when Candlemas um, yes. is the end of Christmas, but we take down other decorations on January the 6th. Well, uh, Candlemas is right. I mean, the earliest accounts of when you take the decorations down in churches, again, Herrick, who is the sort of Christmas poet of that time, he, uh, he says you take down a Candlemas, which is early February. Um, and so you, sh you can keep them up till then, that's, that's absolutely fine, yeah. Um, in terms of other decorations, uh, oh, you know, put them, take them down when you want. Who cares? You know, I mean, really, if you've got, let's be honest, if you've got your whole house illuminated, you might not want to keep that going. I mean, the neighbours might want to keep it. But yeah, traditionally, Candlemas was the time when you redecorated the church and changed changed the greenery. Um, 
and cleaned it out and, and uh, lit, lit candles, as the name implies. Um, in terms of the 12 days, they were added in, I think, I'm doing this from memory, I'm terrible at dates, at 576 AD, they were the Council of Tours announced that the 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany were the 12 days of Christmas. And really, one of the main things about that is there's nothing else to do. I mean, what else are you going to do? The 12 days that you can't, you can't sow, you can't plow, the ground's too hard. And so, you know, it seemed an obvious holiday to have. Uh, and so that becomes that, that sort of period. Thanks, Nick. And um, someone, going back to what you've mentioned about music and particularly Carol, someone said here, am I wrong in thinking that music has always been part of devotions in the Christian church, mm -hmm. chanting, playing song, etc.? So I'm surprised to learn that carols are a relatively new thing and that songs were disapproved of in church. Can you say more about this? Yeah, yeah so I wasn't clear enough. So music in church, absolutely. And uh, the, some of the earliest church music we know of is related to Advent, actually. It's the O, I think they're known as the O antiphons, and they date back to sort of 700 or 800. Um, we know that. So, so choirs, um, chants, psalms, singing of psalms. Hymns, though, written poems set to music, um, didn't come in until a lot later, and, uh, you know, with the laity singing them. Um, they are sort of much later in, in invention. And then you have, you know, have um, gallery um, singers and all that kind of stuff. And they were a little bit frowned on. In fact, I, I think I'm right in saying that the Anglican Church didn't officially license him, allow him, him singing until about 1890, something ridiculous like that. I mean, people were doing it way before that. But, you know, the only thing you were, everyone really sang in churches was supposed to be the Psalms, that the Psalter, that was what you sang. And that was OK, because it was all biblical. Anything else was other people's thoughts. And so, um, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. The correspondence is absolutely right. C music as such, big part of all church services from pretty early on. Well, in fact, from apostolic days, they sung. So, you know, we know that. I suppose that ties into tradition now, of, um, especially if you go, um, any of you who are familiar over in the islands, um, I know when I've been over there, um, certain churches over there, they have a tradition of what they call metrical psalms, so a certain type of chanting, um, which post obviously the Reformation in England did quite well and obviously had the nonconformist Methodism really grows on that, but it's still really interesting to see in certain parts of the world, metrical psalms are still very, it's a tradition very much kept alive, um, but obviously in England, um, our traditions have moved on a bit from a metrical um, psalm singing. Um, so we've got a couple more questions that have come in. Um, someone said they haven't had the pleasure of yet reading your book, Nick, so I'm hoping they're going to go and buy it. Um, but they've asked here, does your book also cover any New Year traditions? Uh, a little bit, yes, because some what's happened is in Christmas is like I, I talked about the sort of gravitational pull. Christmas becomes like a black hole that sucks everything in around it. So if you take uh, present buying, for example, Different parts of the world have different traditions about presents. Um, in uh, the Netherlands, for example, St. Nicholas's Day, and there's a lot, lot in the book about um, other traditions like Santa Claus and all that kind of stuff, um, was the 6th of uh, December, St. Nicholas's Day. Um, in, the, in Britain, presents would be given at New Year. That's when they, they were given. And, and gradually they sort of get pulled into Christmas, largely, it seems, as the effect of that famous poem, The Night Before Christmas, or a visit from St. Nicholas, as it's more properly titled. Um, and also Christmas cakes begin as 12th cakes, which were uh, served at New Year. So the two festivals are very closely linked. And a lot of what we used to do traditionally at New Year has sort of got pulled into, into Christmas, really. So I say a little bit about it. No, I'm not massive. I mean, New Year's resolutions and stuff like that. I'll talk about that. Yeah. Thanks. And I think we've got time maybe for um, a couple more questions. But um, one here. What is your favourite Christmas bauble um, tradition that you've uncovered? <laughs> uh, my favourite Christmas bauble. Oh, gosh, that's really hard. I did like the Roman one just because I knew I know it will make so many people grumpy. Uh, I, you know, I, I did. I did quite like finding that out. And because it showed how history worked. Um, I like Turkey, the one about turkeys, actually, which I won't go into, but it's why turkeys are the most geographically misnamed bird and how they're completely misnamed all over the world and even in their Latin name, which is a complete mashup. So the, the one about turkeys is great. Brilliant. Um, and I think um, for a, a final one, um, that we're going to finish on. I'm just, sorry, everyone, if I haven't answered your question, um, do keep them coming and we'll come back to them. Um, 
oh, someone's asked here about the Christmas tree and the Victorian. Someone's read a bit of it and they said, could you com briefly comment on about the, the Christmas tree? Well, Christmas trees, again, a, a really good one. So there's two sort of baubles that are normally told about Christmas tree. One is that, that uh, um, Prince Albert in, introduced it to Britain, which we can dispense with very quickly because Queen Adelaide, um, Queen Victoria's grandmother had Christmas trees up. So he didn't. They did popularise it because they were the equivalent. They were in the equivalent of Hello magazine. Uh, you know, there was an engraving of, of Albert and Victoria on their Christmas tree. So everybody wanted one after that. Christmas trees date back, as far as we can tell, the tradition dates back to the early uh, 15th century, around 1419, 1411. There's a couple of mentions of them in Latvia. Um, they are probably, and I've read several actual histories of Christmas trees, and there are books of that. Uh, they probably um, uh, originate actually with medieval mystery plays. So the day before Christmas, 24th of December, was the Feast of Adam and Eve. And so they would perform plays in certain parts of Europe. You're going to need a tree if you do Adam and Eve. Where are you going to get a tree on the 24th of December? It's not going to be a fruit tree. Uh, there's no leaves on them. So they used a fir tree and they hung fruit on it. And then they would parade it around the streets. And then gradually sort of people um, bought, bought them into halls and then into their homes from that. So it probably originates actually in medieval mystery plays. And that tree should really have a snake in it uh, if you're going to be true to the origins. Well, thank you so much, Nick, um, for answering this question to your lecture and for your time today. And thank you, everyone, okay. um, for taking the time to um, join us today. If you're watching, um, if you're not watching us live, thank you for watching. Um, now, um, everyone, um, we've had a couple more questions I get about the book. So, yeah, you can buy the book through our website. It's eight pounds per person packaging, and it really is um, fantastic. And I see people who buy them throughout. Um, I've just been told to say um, we haven't got many left. So um, do be quick and um, buy uh do buy a copy. We are going to try and order some more um, in stock though. So um, please, um, if you'd like to get a copy, um, do um, order it through our website and we'll post a link onto the chat now. Now, next week, we are going to be joined by Mark Norman. And um, for those of you who know who Mark Norman is, he is um, the creator and host of the Folklore podcast, which is a really fantastic and free uh, or a popular podcast online. And he's going to be talking to us about curses, legends and murder, folklore and strange tales of Thomas the Beckett. Now, this year is a really important anniversary because it's, um, I believe, I'll get my date right, it's 800 years, Beckett 800, um, where we're celebrating 800 years since St. Thomas Beckett was canonised. Now, obviously, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of events that were meant to be taking place across the country have had to be cancelled or postponed. So it's great that we can do this free lecture online um, to kind of look at some of the traditions and um, folklore associated with Thomas the Beckett. Now, this will be the last lunchtime lecture of the year. Um, we have got more plans. We've got a whole series planned right up till April so far, um, and we'll be posting details of those um, next week. So do join us next Thursday um, and we'll, um, we look forward to seeing you then. But if you've got any questions, um, any ideas for future lectures or any people you'd like us to get reach out to, do comment away and we'll do our best to try and schedule that all in. But as we said at the start of this lecture, um, these lectures are all free. Um, we make the recordings available if you free of charge. So please do consider supporting us by making a donation. Um, it, we really do need your support um, to look after our historic churches. So as I said, you can text, um, you can text CCT to 70 double nine one to give a gift of three pounds or you can text cct to seven zero one nine one to give a gift of ten pounds or finally as we said there's a current um, we're currently running a membership offer whereby if you sign up by direct debit you will get a free copy of matthew burns beautiful church's book which is this book here um so um please um do consider joining us we'd love to welcome you as a member but that's everything from us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you next Thursday. But as we all said at the start of the lecture, do join us on Saturday, this coming Saturday at 6 p.m. UK time, um, where we'll be having our online The Big Christmas Carol service. And I said we've got a lot of um, celebrity guests taking um, part in that service, including His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Um, there's details of the... Um, event on the chat we'll post another link to the chat uh, the event now um but the stream just so you know as we start the stream for these lectures early we're starting the stream at 5 45 um where there'll be some music played before but the service itself will not start until 6 p.m and it is a completely free christmas carol service so we look forward to welcoming you there but once again thank you so much um for taking the time to chat to us today nick we really appreciate it well thank you to all of our viewers joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in the future Take care, everyone.